Good morning, church. It is great to be with you today. Um, my wife is pretty much technically full term uh, in her pregnancy with our third boy. And so, thank you. So, we recorded um, this message on Thursday, and I tell you, it, it, recording in a blank or a empty room is, does not compare to being able to gather in person and worship Jesus together and gather as a community. So I am so grateful to be with you today. If you are new, welcome. If you are joining us online, welcome. My name is Eric. I'm one of the pastors here at Landing Place Church. Well, when I was 18 years old, uh, me and a buddy of mine named Sean had gym passes to this super swanky 24-hour fitness in Centennial. It was the super sport edition. It was essentially a timeshare meets a gym. Uh, it was very nice inside. So one night we were done with our workout and we decided, hey, let's just go goof around in the gym. And so I went into, we went into the basketball court and we saw all the basketballs and then we just had the bright idea, let's play dodgeball. Uh, just the two of us, but let's just play dodgeball together. And so instead of pay playing in the massive gym area, we decided we're going to go in the racquetball court. Now, if you've ever seen a racquetball court, it's three sides of it are solid, and then one side is completely glass, including the door. So we take like six to eight basketballs, go into the racquetball court, and for some reason, there was a 10-pound medicine ball in there. So we were like, let's add this to the mix, a little plot twist. And so we line up all of the basketballs, dodgeball, and then we just start chucking them at each other. And we're like laughing, but we're also like in a lot of pain as well, because when you get hit with a basketball, it's not fun. And then I see my buddy Sean about 15 feet away from me, pick up the medicine ball. And a medicine ball, like it's heavy. You can't just throw it. You can't just chuck it like a basketball. I see him wind up like he's an Olympic shot putter, and he lunges this thing at my face. And I had enough sense, like, there's no way that I'm going to be able to catch this thing. So in a, in a moment of matrix-like desperation, I move out of the way, and then in slow motion, I see this medicine ball co go towards the glass wall behind me. And in slow motion, it collides with the glass door, and shards of glass come raining from the ceiling, broken completely off of the hinges. There's a pile of glass on the floor, and I look at my buddy and I just say, run. <laughs> and so I'm in flip-flops, so I'm trying to like get over this glass pile, and then I realize very quickly that the Holy Spirit reminded me, there's cameras everywhere. <laughs> They've already seen what you've done. And so I look at my buddy and I'm just like, we gotta go fess up. So we go to the front desk, you can imagine the look on the guy's face. He said some choice words to us uh, and then said, you guys are probably going to have to pay for this thing. So in, for a week, we just wait in shame and guilt, wondering, are we going to have to pay for this $2,000 glass door? Thankfully, we got a call and they said, yeah, this is why we have insurance. Yes. Um, that they were letting off the, us off the hook, but if we were to do it again, they would take our gym passes. Fine. Deal. Easy. But I look back on that story. And I think, I started a conflict. I broke someone's stuff. Like, this was squarely my responsibility. But my very first reaction was to dodge responsibility at all costs. To dodge the ways that I have been the offender in this situation and tried to weasel myself out. Have you ever felt that in the midst of a conflict where maybe some, someone points out something that you've done to them and you're just ready to bring out the list of all the things that they've done to you to get even with them? And instead of owning your part in the conflict, it's much easier to pinpoint them. Today, we're going to focus on all about our own part, the part we play within the midst of a conflict. Other people or the other person, they have their stuff that they need to deal with. We're not talking about owning their stuff. We're talking about owning our stuff in the midst of it. Uh, we have been in a series called Resolving Everyday Conflict, and we're in week two. 
Um, and part of this series, we put together a devotional, a 28-day devotional. So if you're just hopping in, I would encourage you to text the number behind me. It's going to be up behind me for a while. Uh, you would get access to our daily devotionals that we'll send out. This is a way where you can process these kind of things in your God time, in your small group. So strongly encourage you to check that out. Well, last week, Mark spoke on when we face conflict, the first thing that we're to do is to go higher to bring God into our situation, that the Holy Spirit is our advocate, and so we go to him and ask him to help in the midst of a situation. This week, we're going to talk about all about getting real with ourselves and owning our part. Because conflict, um, whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, it's not a matter of if we face conflict, it's a matter of when we face conflict. And for those of us um, that are here today, we're, look, we're asking the question, what, is, what, is, what does God have to do in the midst of conflict? What does God expect? And how are we to approach conflict with God's help when it arises? So let's pray before we go on. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful for today. We're so grateful for your church. We're so grateful to come together and worship you and proclaim your name, the hope that we have in you and that you enter into our dark situations. You care about the heavy and you care about the light. And God, you care about what is burdening our hearts, especially in the moments of conflict, which are so complex. There's a lot of personalities, histories, opinions, hurts, and habits that are at play. And so, Lord, we invite you. Will you speak to us even about present conflict with you, with, that we are in? And will you give us the courage to assess our part in it so that we can address those things and take one step forward to resolving conflict and being peacemakers who are empowered by your spirit? I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. If you're like me, and I invite you to consider a conflict that you're in and your part in it, maybe there's this sense of churning within you. Uh, maybe your face kind of gets red because you're thinking, no, I don't want to address my stuff. Like, why can't the other person go first? Like, I want to focus on how they have offended me. And then maybe at another time when it's more convenient for me, then we can kind of address my stuff. But it's not easy. It's not natural for us to think about how we have been an offender in a certain, certain situation. And yet, God calls us, Jesus calls us to see and engage in conflict in a new way. So I want to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 7. If you have your Bible uh, or the app, I'm going to be in the ESV, uh, English Standard Version. If you don't, no worries, we're going to have the scripture on the screen behind me. But as you turn there, let me set the scene for you. Jesus is with his 12 disciples in a massive crowd on the side of a mountain at the Sea of Galilee. And he is in the middle of preaching his most famous sermon called the Sermon on the Mount. And as he's teaching, he's talking to people, telling people about God and God's kingdom and, and how God relates to people and how people are relate to God. And in this section, how the people of God are to relate to others, whether they are also Jesus followers or not. Now, some of you, uh, m m many of us in the room, um, we're, uh, we would consider ourselves Jesus followers. Um, in this scripture that we're going to be in, Jesus is laying the expectation for Jesus followers. But many of you in this room, you might just be, you're not on the Jesus train yet. Um, you're checking this faith, faith thing out. Uh, you might be here out of your, your own free will, or maybe someone dragged you. But either way, we're glad you're here. This is a safe place for you to ask questions, bring your doubts uh, bring your hurts, those kind of things. But whether you're a Jesus follower or a skeptic, everyone who Jesus is talking to on this mountain and everybody in this room can relate because Jesus is, ad is addressing conflict and how we treat one another in the middle of conflict. So let's consider the words of Jesus. In chapter 7, starting in verse 3, Jesus says, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? This is God's word. Jesus was a master 
at using simple word pictures to convey very big things. He's not literally talking to two lumberjacks in front of, them, or in front of him that have different sizes of wood in their eyes. He's speaking, he's speaking in metaphor here. And the picture that Jesus paints is actually a comical one because you have this, this person who has this log attached to their face who's trying to help someone who has a little speck or a splinter of wood in their eye. Like this has more of the, the feeling of Cartoon Network or the Three Stooges because Log Face is trying to help speckled eye sort his stuff out. But someone who has some, an object like this big in front of their, their face, how are they going to do anything helpful? They're going to stumble and fumble and hurt themselves and probably hurt the other person. But here's what Jesus is saying. Someone with a log and someone with a splinter. The log and the splinter are both pieces of wood. They're different sizes, but they're both pieces of wood. And the wood here represents an offense or a sin. And Jesus is not necessarily talking about one's per, one person's sin being greater than the other. He's talking about our tendency in a conflict to maximize someone else's sin and minimize our own. And it creates this sense of someone's not owning up to their stuff and how it affects people in the midst of conflict. Look at the language that he uses in verse 3. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? The person with the log is so focused on the other person's offense, on the other person's shortcomings, that they're not even aware of their own shortcomings. They're not even aware of what is in front of their own face. They're, they're blinded by their own shortcomings. When we're in conflict with someone, and we're, not, uh, it, we're, we're just seeing with our frontal lobe only, where anger is just at a peak, and all we can do is just pinpoint on how the other person is offending us, we're not aware of how we actually might be stirring the pot and escalating the situation. And when we're not aware of those things, we end up saying something or doing something that we regret and only amplifying the situation. Because when we're not aware of these things, how we see the other person becomes distorted. The conversation becomes distorted and that leads us to saying something or doing something. If you miss everything else of today. This is the big idea of today to walk away with, that before we engage in conflict, we must own our part. I must own my part. You might be asking, why do I need to go first? Why can't we address them and then come back to me? Well, look at what Jesus says. In verse 5, he goes on to say, you hypocrite. Strong words. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. A hypocrite is someone who says something and does the opposite, or someone who does something and then says the opposite. In Jesus' time, especially in like Greco-Roman theater, a hypocrite was an actor. They were someone who was a real person, but they had a mask on. And so hypocrisy in that moment in a, in a play would be as someone is pretending to be someone else, they're not actually themselves. And what Jesus is saying is that when we, do, we, we are acting, we are hypocrites when we are, not a, when we are not aware of how we are part of the problem in a situation. And that we need to get real and own our part. Why? Because he says, take the log out, then you will see clearly. It's only when we address our stuff that we are responsible for. Again, other people have their stuff. They need to address their stuff. And that'll come later. But we need to own our part and take responsibility for our part. Because when we do the situation becomes right-sized. A few years back, Snickers an, uh, rad, uh, ran an ad campaign that said, you are not you when you're hungry. Snickers satisfies. So there'd be a bunch of football, football players in a match, and for some reason, Betty White is in the middle of the huddle. And Betty White is just getting tackled left and right, and then the football captain says, 
what's going on out there, man? You're playing like Betty White. And then someone comes and gives Betty White a Snickers, and she turns back into the guy who is actually playing, and then it says, you are not you when you're hungry. Snickers satisfies. Can anyone else relate? Like, when you're hungry, you turn into a different person. Yep, seeing some hands. So when I am properly hangry, which is hunger that manifests with anger, everything is amplified. I'm short, I'm irritable, I'll perceive sarcasm as a personal dig, and I'm just ready to engage. It's only when I eat that my blood pressure calms down, I can think more clearly, and then I realize I need to say sorry for some things that I said while I was hangry. It's only when I took care of what was going on on the inside, hunger in this case, that the situation and the person became right-sized and I was able to interact as myself again. The, the outlook, the, con- the, the conflict became right-sized. So, so it is when we are in an emotional conflict, an argument, that when we deal with what's going on on the inside, when we're aware of those things, we can address them, and then we're able to work towards resolving the conflict with the other person. You might be thinking, okay, okay, I get the word picture. Take the log out of the eye, but how? How do I actually do that? How do I own my part? I'm going to give you four practical steps. The first one is we need to ask for God's help. In Psalm 139, uh, David writes, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. That is a brave and dangerous prayer to pray because it's a prayer of illumination because God is the one who knows us, sees us, hears us. He knows what we see, feel, and have done, and he knows what we will see, feel, and do. And so David is praying, God, you see it all. Point out anything in me, in my desires, in my thoughts, in my actions that I'm not aware of and reveal them to me so that I can address them and lead me in the way of everlasting life. It is a dangerous prayer but a needed prayer that we need to ask God, show me how you see this situation. Is there anything that I'm not aware of that I have done? Reveal it to me that I may address it. Last week, Mark talked about going higher, that when we face conflict, we're to invite God in the situation, that the the Holy Spirit will come and and help us. And this week is similar yet different because this is a moment where we go back uh, away from the conflict, peel back the layers a little bit, and ask, okay, God, you're my referee in this situation. Show me the things that you see, point them out so that I can address them. So in this sense, we need to ask God how we are being a part of the problem. And then also we need God's help to do the second thing, which is we also need to check our feelings. Check my feelings. Uh, This last summer, June, July, in the heat of the summer, 90 degree days, 100 degree days, I get in our van and I turn the car on, I turn the AC on, I hear a noise and then I just go drive. As I'm driving, I realize that I'm sweating profusely, and the AC is on, but only hot air is coming out. And so when I get back home, the first thing I do is I open up the hood to see what's going on. As we, for our cars, noises in our cars and lights on the dashboard are indicators of something that the car needs, or something that's going on within the car that needs to be addressed. So it is with our feelings. Our feelings are indicators of what's going on within our hearts and in our minds. What we're feeling, assumptions that we're believing, and those play a part in in conflict. And if we don't address those things, if we're not aware of those things, then we'll keep just being triggered. Nothing will change, and 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 the conflict will continue to go. And we might not even ever address it. We might even sweep it under the rug. Even 30 years later, it's still unresolved. But it's when we own our part by able to identifying what's going on within us that we're able to start to right-size the situation and be able to realize our weak spots, our vulnerabilities, when we're provoked, when we're offended, what makes us angry, 
and how to be more proactive and how we respond to it when it comes, comes up again. So we look under the hood and we look at what's going on. So for instance, let's take sadness, the feeling of sadness. Sadness is this feeling of loss or grief that someone has said something or there's a relationship that is fractured and we feel this sense of grief or someone makes us sad in a conversation. The question is, how do, how do we respond when we feel sad? Do we go to that person? Do we talk to them about our sadness? Um, do, or do we respond by avoiding them, attacking them, inviting them in, stonewalling them? What, what, is, what does sadness lead to when we feel provoked in that way? Or let's take, let's take anger. Anger, probably the most common feeling, the most volatile feeling that comes up in the midst of a conflict. Anger is this fiery desire that when it's at its best, it's a desire for justice. It's a desire for a wrong to be made right. But anger can easily become destructive, as many of us have have either been the given, givers of those or the receivers of those. But anger is a secondary emotion. Anger is fueled by something else that is going on within our hearts. So if you get angry in the midst of a conversation or you feel your face getting hot, the first part is to recognize I'm getting mad right now. The second question is why? What was said? What provoked? For instance, you may be hurt by something that someone says and your anger is fueled by that hurt, which leads to resentment. And you start resenting that other person, which leads you to saying or doing things that are only amplifying the situation. Or maybe we get angry because someone has pointed out something to us that it requires a change, but that means that we're going to lose this sense of control of the situation. And we don't like being out of control. And so we get angry and we get louder in order to overcompensate to get that control back. Or maybe we feel lonely in the presence of the person that we're in conflict with. Because sometimes there's nothing worse than being seen by someone physically but they don't actually see what's going on within your heart or what they're saying, and you feel alone in, in their presence. And in order to get their attention, you get louder, you get angrier, in order as a cry out, see me, pay attention to me. And again, that leads to doing things or saying things that end up, the cause and effect ends up being destructive. But it's when we look under the hood and realize, okay, they said this, it caused hurt, I'm angry about this, this is how I reacted. When we're able to see those things, it transforms the way that we're able to respond and then also identify, this is what's going on within me that I need to address. Something else is going on in here that I need to address first before I can come back and deal with the situation in a healthy way. Sometimes it's really easy to see our motives. It's really to see, easy to understand the triggers and the A, B, C, and the chain of events. Other times, depending on the conflict, if, if the situation is so complex, there's a lot going on, a lot of habits to address. Sometimes it's not easy to see up from down, right from wrong. And when we find ourselves in those situations where we check our feelings and it's not, it doesn't make sense, we need to go to the third part, the third step, which is seeking wise counsel. With my um, AC in our van, I get home, I look under the hood, and like any professional, I start YouTubing a solution. So I find out that my car has fuses. I didn't know that it had fuses. Um, so I start messing with the fuses to see, is it an electrical thing? I get the re can of refrigerant to see if it's low and it needs to get powered on again. Um, nothing was working. So I thought, okay, I'm just gonna keep driving and turning the AC on and off and on again, and maybe if I hit a bump when I turn it on, it'll springboard some mechanism, and then I'll just have cool air again. So I did this for weeks, and after losing all of my water weight from sweating so much, I finally realized I gotta take this thing in. I do not know how to fix this thing. So I took it to a friend at a local auto shop, and he has all of the diagnostic tools. 
hooks my van up, checks for leaks, all of these different hoses and stuff like that. And he comes back to me with the unfortunate but very clear news that I need a brand new AC. And I kind of suspected that, but he confirmed that. So we agreed, he ordered the part, installed it the next day, cool, crisp air ever since. When we find ourselves where the check engine light is on, the noises are going on within us, we can't see up from down, we need someone, wise counsel, who we can go and talk with. The emphasis is on wise, because we all have sources or people in our life where maybe they're more vo- motivated by gossip and inflaming the situation as opposed to really helping us out. Because someone who is wise is someone who's going to be able to ask high-level questions, get an understanding of both sides of the situations, point out our blind spots, and confirm what is true, both the good, the bad, and the ugly. A wise person, a wise source, they're people in our lives where they have a reputation as being a peacemaker. They resolve conflict well. They're people in our, in our lives where we, we look at like, I know that they get in conflict with their wife. I know that they get in fights with their kids. But the way that they handle it is it seems like everything is resolved. And the way that I talk with them and how they go about that process, they resolve conflict really well. These are the people in our lives that we need to talk to and say, hey, this is the situation. I am not aware of my blind spots. I'm not sure how to go forward. Will you have a conversation with me? These are the people in our lives that could be a spouse, a parent, a friend, a coworker, even a professional counselor, especially a professional counselor. And sometimes we need just a combination of all of these relationships in our life, depending on what the, the situation is like. I tell you that when, when we ask God for help, when we check our feelings, when we seek wise counsel, it's in those moments we start to see the log in front of our face. And not only see it, but the log starts to come out. We're able to start taking that log out and addressing it. We're not only to notice the log, to ourselves, but we're also to notice it to God and, you got it, the other person. In order to fully own our part, the fourth thing that we need to do is confess our part. Confess my part. Confession is an acknowledgement of something that is true. In the, in the sense of conflict, Confession is our acknowledgement of how we have offended or done something wrong or said something wrong. Now, we can do this with God, either with words or with thoughts, because he's all-knowing and he knows our thoughts, and we can communicate with him in that way. But when, it, when, it, when another person is involved, we have to confess with words. We have to confess with words to them. A good confession is detailed, is honest, it's sorrowful, and is coupled with a plan of action for how you're going to correct the mistake. Um, A conflict that often comes up between Carly and I, don't worry, I cleared this with her, she gave me the approval, so I'm not stirring up conflict as I'm talking right now, but a conflict that happens within our household is when I am running late, and I am trying to gather my things, keys, a notebook, my backpack, if I can't find things right away, I get, I get on edge really quickly, I get irritable, I get impatient, and so what's going on within me is I am scared that I'm going to be late for something and I'm going to have to face the consequences for being late to that meeting. That fear manifests in irritability and anger, and so all of a sudden I'm looking around with, I can't find my stuff. Now Carly is a phenomenal decorator and organizer of our home. Like when you walk in, it's like straight out of Magnolia Journal. Like it's very nice. And even when our kids make messes, I make messes, when I come home, it'll, everything will just be clean. Well, sometimes when she's cleaning, she misplaces my stuff. Sometimes. But in moments 
when I am looking for something, I'm late, I interpret that sometimes to always. Carly, I can't find my keys. I can't find my notebook. You're always moving my stuff. I can't see, I can't, I can't find these things. And then I'm frustrated and I'm, 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 I'm bringing it out towards her. But here's the problem. I have man eyes. So come on. <laughs> the wives in here are like, oh, I know where this is going. This sounds familiar. Man eyes means that something can be in front of my face and I don't see it. So Carly asks for an onion for a recipe. I go and I say, hey, we don't have any more. She opens up the drawer. There's the onion. So for me, I can, I can literally see something in front of me and not process it. In so many situations, the notebook is right where I left it. The keys are right where I left it. My sunglasses are hanging from my shirt and I don't feel it. And it's in those moments I can respond in two ways. One is to go into temptation and say, yeah, Carly, I know that I said this, but you do this quite a bit. Or I'm sorry if I hurt you, but you do this quite a bit. If your confession has the words if or but in them, totally negates the validity and the authenticity of it. What is true, and when I choose the way of Jesus, I look at her and say, I am so sorry. These were right where I left them. I was scared that I was going to be late. And when I got scared, I got angry and I got focused that, that you were the one that did this and you did not. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? And also, thanks. Thanks for the clap because my wife is here right now. And so, yeah. <laughs> but like with anything, I'm still in process. I still make mistakes. The, but the thing is, is that in a, in, a, in a good confession, it's honest, but then I also need to communicate, next time this happens, I'm going to take a step back and then ask you, hey, have you seen this? And then go look for it, rather than, where is this? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go about this differently. There are many times in my life, in my marriage, in my relationship with parents, coworkers, friends, when we're in conflict and I take a step back, and I'm just like, God, I need you to help me see in this situation. And then I look under the hood and check my feelings to see what is at play here? What is, what is motivating me? Why am I getting so provoked? And sometimes I'll go to a friend and say, hey, I need you, your help to make sense of this. Where did things go wrong? It's in those moments when I'm able to see how I have been the offender in that situation and own up to my wrongdoing and realize that before God and the other person as I confess, the temperature of the conflict radically changes. When I say, I'm sorry, I see how I affected you. Will you forgive me? More often than not, the other person, the bristles will come down, the conversation becomes diffused and they'll say, Thank you for seeing that. I also see how I have hurt you. And they own their stuff. But sometimes I'll own my stuff and the other person won't. And then I'm tempted to get angry again because the scales of justice are out of balance and I want to get even with them. But in those moments when I turn to Jesus and I realize, hey, I have owned my stuff, they still have a part, I'm able to see them more right-sized, and then I'm able to position, I'm, I'm positioned to be able to help them own their stuff. Next week, Mark is going to talk about how we go about helping other people own their stuff, their offenses, how they have hurt us. But before we get there, we have to get real and own our part in a situation. During this next song, I want to invite you to ask the Lord to help you answer these two questions. First, what destructive feelings and assumptions are at play within me in a present conflict now? And two, who do I need to confess to? During this next song, spend some time with the Lord asking him for help to process these questions. Lord God, it's in teachings like this, Jesus, where you totally flip the script that we desperately 
need you. We need your help to pursue the good and better way of you by the power of your spirit to own our stuff, God, in order to take one more step forward to being peacemakers empowered by your spirit. So Lord, in these moments, will you speak to us clearly? Will you help us to look under the hood, to check our feelings? And Lord, will you help us to go seek help if we need it and give us the courage to confess to you and the other person our part. God, will you free us from the grip of resentment, of bitterness. God, lead us towards forgiveness and healing. We pray this by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.